That's right. Um, tonight we are going to be doing something called Ask It Basket, something that I really appreciate, something that I love, because what it is, it's basically um, five testimonies in one. Um, at the end of every month, the last Monday of every month, we're going to be doing some kind of testimony. It could be something like this. It could be a few mini testimonies. It could be one testimony. But we're going to be um, celebrating at the end of every month the way that God is able to do good works in our life. And that's actually what we just finished singing about, how God is able to do things in our life. And the big book of um, AA talks about that, you know, in the on pages 83 and 84, it says, um, the last promise is we will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. And so I think that's a really powerful thing. So at this point, I'd love to invite up our panel, and we are going to get this going. I've been known to fall off of bar stools. <laughs> that's right. No seatbelts on these. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. And so um, as you guys walked in, we asked people to fill out a card, you know, just write a question that they had um, about recovery, maybe about spirituality, maybe about church. And we're going to hear from our uh, panel. But before we do that, I'd like everybody to go. I'm going to start with the far end there and to um, introduce yourself. Let us know um, how many years you have in recovery. And then we'll just come down this way and then we'll begin. Uh, my name is Larry Moore and I have 36 years by the grace of God. Nice, yes. I'm Diane, you guys don't and I, I celebrate 29 years of continuous sobriety. I'm Christine, and I work a program for codependency, and I have 19 years this month. Yeah. Hi, I'm Linda, and I work a program for uh, alcohol and drug addiction and for codependency. <laughs> and I... Um, have 20, 26 <laughs> years this month. Yeah. Yeah. My name's Bill. Is this on? Okay. Um, so alcohol, drugs, codependency, anger, uh, driving issues. Um, 26 years and one day on Sunday, last Sunday. Keep coming back. <laughs> so. So by the end of the night, they may be sitting on opposite sides of the stage. <laughs> Addicted to shiny metal objects. <laughs> At least I know we're going to separate rooms. <laughs> All <Amen>. right. <laughs> I mean here. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, we are in CR, and we got a spot for everybody here. It's all good. Um, my name is Curtis. I'm an addict and alcoholic. And hey, Curtis. Hey, and I'll be celebrating... Um, Eight years this summer. Really excited about that. All right. So for our first question, this is a really hard question, and so we might as well get it going that way. Um, I'd like to start with Christine. It says, why did God let this happen to me? So I don't believe that God caused the things that have happened in my life, but I believe that I live in a sinful world and I've made some choices and a lot of my choices come with natural consequences. And so I believe that God has had his hand on me through all of this, but he is not the cause of the things that have happened to me that I have gone through in my life. Yep. Bill, you want to take that too? Uh, yeah, I'd like to elaborate a little bit. Um, my, my first Bible study after many years of addiction and getting involved in the church was the book of Job. Um, and after looking what he went through and what Jesus went through, quite honestly, um, and knowing that I did that to him, it's not really a question of why did it happen to me. Yeah, I think oftentimes um, in my life I felt like, um, you know, where 
this is what God wanted for me in my life. Um, you know, that I was only supposed to be a criminal and an addict. Um, but I can realize that as I was pursuing um, recovery, as I gave my life to Christ, um, that was the reality that I had started to live into, um, was that I was only supposed to be a criminal and an addict. And so as I dedicated my life to Christ, as I started pursuing recovery, I realized, just like we just said, you know, that God was doing for me things that I could not do for myself, and it was good. And then I saw my hand in a lot of the things that were happening to me that I felt like it was God's persecution. Now, that's a, a strong way to say, you know, I'm not saying that that is, um, you know, a blanket statement across the board, but oftentimes we can see the decisions that we've made um, have caused us to be in here. And that's why we say in recovery, our best thinking got us here. And so, yep. I got the truck in the ditch. The Lord helped me get it out. There it is. Can you say that one more time? Huh? Can you say that I one said, more time? I said, I got the truck in the ditch. The Lord helped me get it out. Yep. Thank you. Next question. What do you do if you get triggered what do you do if you get triggered, and how do you stop spinning over it? I stop what? Spinning, like it's just playing over and over in your head. Um, Diane, could you take this? Like I have experiences getting triggered. So um, I, I read it in the other blue book that said um, my, my serenity is contingent on my connection with my higher power. So on good days when I've um, prayed in the morning and um, my morning's going as planned, then I'm less likely to get triggered. So my triggers usually um, become a problem when I haven't prayed and I'm getting irritated and I'm... I'm I'm sleep deprived or that halt, I'm hungry, I'm angry, I'm lonely, I'm tired, and it doesn't usually take much to get triggered. So um, just recently I had a situation at work and I'm so busy, but I, I did what I needed to do and I took a moment and I sent a text to my sponsor and I just said, I've lost my gratitude. And she texted me back with words of support and um, somebody else texted me a picture of a bird feeder with a robin eating bird seed. And it was enough to, like, reboot. Like, it got me out of that spin cycle. And I was able to catch my breath and reconnect. And um, so uh, in early recovery... I spent a long time in that spin cycle, and that spin cycle can have me um, listening to old tapes and old lies and the enemy trying to convince me that the only tool I've got is to pick up use. Um, so having used better tools like having a sponsor and reaching out and asking someone for help. Here's a good one for me. Calling somebody I know might be struggling themselves and just a, hey, I'm thinking about you, and a phone call, and it just changes my focus. It gets my focus out of my own, my own stuff. That's all. Nice. Thank you. Um, Linda, did you want to take that? The question is, um, where is the question? What do you do if you get triggered and can't stop spinning over it? Stop spinning. So um, it's funny, Diane touched on those old tapes. And um, so I recently have uh, been looking at it different as broken soundtracks and the things that, you know, I, I'm recognizing those things that I tell myself. So if I'm spinning, I write it down and I have to write a new soundtrack. And, and so that, you know, it's almost like, where's the truth in it? You know, all those thoughts that run around my head that I, that's what gets me spinning. So I have to stop and I have to find the truth and then focus on that. That's great. Uh, real quick. Um, 
those trigger mechanisms usually are based off our behavioral patterns. Um, we gotta change our behaviors. Um, those old soundtracks are always there, like Linda said, we just gotta build on them um, and fill them with the right stuff. For me, one of the hardest soundtracks is, hi, my name's Bill, I'm an alcoholic. And that picture of what an alcoholic looks like, I know so deeply. Um, but hi, my name's Bill, I'm an alcoholic, but a son of God. I continue that soundtrack. I don't leave the song unplayed. I play who I am today. Great. Thank you. Next, um, a couple of people have already touched on this subject, and so I think this is a good question. Why should I get a sponsor? Um, Christine? When I read the 12 steps, none of them say I. They all say we. And that's because it's a we program, because I bought my seat in this room by myself because my stinking thinking is my stinking thinking and so for me it's super important to have other people who can speak into my life and I've done step studies I've gone to groups but my biggest growth has come sitting across the table from my sponsor the one person that what I consider is I can get naked in front of and I can tell her everything and she can see every part of me and she still loves me and she's got nothing to gain from speaking hard truths to me. And so for me, when I hear those hard truths, a lot of times I hate them. And in the moment, I just want to get up and leave the table, but I know she has nothing to gain and that her heart is for me and not against me and normally my heart is against me. So having someone who's Team Christine is super important. Nice, thank you. Can I add to that? So I recently was talking with somebody about this too and I spent you know, the majority of my time figuring out how to manipulate everybody around me and then including myself. And I couldn't even recognize when I was manipulating myself, that's how cutting, baffling, and powerful the disease is. So I need another person to intervene in that, that circle of madness. Nice. Larry? My best thinking got me drunk. <laughs> 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 and, uh, you know, if, um, if I want to learn how to do something, I'm going to go on YouTube, or I'm going to go find out from somebody else how to do it. And if I want to get sober, i got to find out how to do it. Because my best thinking ain't going to get me there, right? I tried that before and it didn't work, by the way. Um, <laughs> but uh, why walk when you can take the bus? And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's another thing. Um, we talk about humility and that little bit of humility to say, I can't do this by myself. And, uh, you know, I, uh, somebody else has done this. Uh, how'd you do it, man? You know, it's. It's what um, Dale says, one beggar telling another beggar how to find bread. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, Diane? Want to continue to elaborate? I think this is a great question, um, and I think getting uh, many different perspectives on it is going to help a lot of people. So, so my walk in recovery... Um, has been up and down. I've had, I've had sponsors throughout. I've had different sponsors. I've had sponsors go out. I had a sponsor die early in recovery. I've had, I've had a rough, um, sometimes path with re with in recovery with sponsors. And I would say those times that I was. I was. I never quit going to meetings. I never um, stopped working that first half of that first step, recognizing that I'm powerless over whatever it is that's driving me crazy. Um, but my times without a sponsor, without having somebody that I trusted, that I was exposed, exposing my deepest stuff to, somebody who I wasn't staying completely honest with, with what was going on between my ears. Because that stuff, nobody will know what that stuff sounds like unless I put words to it. So um, 
those times in my recovery that I've had a sponsor where I could pick up the phone. And I had a sponsor quit on me one time, fired, fired me. She didn't quit. She fired me because I wasn't <laughs> doing the work. So hashtag do the dang work. That's um, right. Those times, and I told her I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna let her go. She was still gonna be my sponsor, and she, she took my call every time I called. Having somebody like that in my life to reach out to, and to tell them what's going on, um, is way better than like swimming in quicksand by myself. It's nice to know there's somebody mm. who, who wants, not only wants to help, is willing to help. And so, anyway, I, I say if you don't have a sponsor yet, get somebody's phone number who you can call and ask for help when you need it, yep. before you need it. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think she touched on a really great point there. You know, um, what happens if um, your sponsor relapses? You know, what happens if the person that you are trusting in ends up going out? You're trusting them with... St how to show you the ropes of recovery and then they have, end up relapsing. And I want to give you permission that you do not have to relapse with them. Um, when I first got out of, uh, when I first came back from Colorado, um, I had a sponsor, he was doing really good. He was meeting me, he was answering all my phone calls. Something changed, he started to um, not answer all my phone calls. We started to not be able to meet up all the time. And about six months after um, we decided that this relationship wasn't working out, um, he ended up relapsing. Um, I'm here to tell you that I did not have to relapse with that person. Um, that because they decided to make a decision that went against the things that I believed in doesn't mean I had to follow them. We're, we're deciding to follow somebody to do good, to have recovery. We're not deciding to follow someone to the ends of the earth and into their hell. And so um, I think that's something that I've seen a good amount of times, um, and I don't want that to end up surprising you. Um, so yeah, man, please. Um, yeah, it's, it's real easy to um, idolize your sponsor. I mean, because you're looking for help and you're starting a new life. Um, but it's real important to know for me that it's a new life in Christ, and God will always come first. It's easy to fall in that pattern because if you idolize your sponsor and they go out and use, it's, you can end up hopeless, really. Yep. Thank you guys, um, that was a really big subject. And so the next question, um, I can answer this really quick. Do I have to attend this church to be able to come to recovery here? Um, the answer is no. <laughs> um, you do not have to attend this church. Um, you actually don't even need to be a, a Christ. Oh, no, I do. I'm a recovery pastor. I have to. Um, but the idea is that you don't have to. You know, what we offer on a Monday night is experience, strength, and hope regarding recovery in Christ. And if that's something you're interested in, then you are welcome. If that's something that you think somebody else may be interested um, in, then they are welcome. You don't have to go to this church. You could give to another church, you can attend another church, you can serve at another church, or you don't even have to attend church. Um, in order to come to uh, get recovery, all you have to do is want recovery. That's it. Good answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so, how can I be sure confidentiality is really being utilized, and what happens if somebody breaks it? And we will go with Diane. Me? <laughs> oh, okay. How can we be sure, sure about confidentiality? <laughs> <laughs> well, they are married, and so technically they are one flesh, so that's cool. <laughs> well, before you get to the fourth step, there's three others. And if you're working the steps with a sponsor, um, by the time you get to four, you kind of have an understanding of who you're working with and who, who uh, you know, what kind of relationship you have with that sponsor. And uh, so, um, you know, you, you, you build up a trust. And I know trust doesn't come easy to a lot of us, especially you've been out on the streets and everything. But, you know, just little bits and pieces, you start trusting and you see how it works out. Personal experience, um, 
my first fifth step that I did, the guy went back out drinking. Now, am I worried about it? No, because when he's out there drinking, he's selfish and self-centered and worried about himself, and he doesn't care about what I said. It's like nobody cares about what I'm drinking either. So um, God takes care of all that, I do believe. Great. So I wasn't worried about it. And I don't think he was at the bar talking about Larry's fifth step. I think he had other things to do. Yeah. <laughs> Dan, um, Confidentiality. Yes, and what happens if, if um, somebody breaks it? All right, so, um, so I'm, I'm a, um, we're married, and I joined the small groups where all the women are. And this program takes confidentiality at a high value. And so it wouldn't take much for us women because we talk and we care about each other to um, walk down the hallway and still carry on a conversation. And so, and I've seen this, I've seen us do this. Somebody in the conversation recognizes the behavior and calls us out on it. So um, confidentiality sounds like gossip. If, if the person that we're sharing information on isn't there. So that's, that's the confidentiality in the small groups. Between each one of us, one-on-one, -on -one, um, what would happen? I mean, I just, I think this program, we've, we've done really well. It's, it's one of the top guidelines. There's only five little guidelines, and that's one of them. And the phrase is, what you hear here stays here. That means if you're not here in this room, that anything that's said up here now is not to be shared outside of these rooms. And um, so that in the event somebody's heart opens and we start sharing important things, um, I can trust that it's not going to go anywhere further from here. Here, here. That's right. Can I add one more thing? Sure. That um, the uh, confidentiality is between a sponsor and a sponsee. Um, you don't want to be sharing your innermost secrets in the big group or in the small group. Uh, it's not to be done at an AA meeting, um, especially if there's things where you could be going to jail <laughs> over it. But in the confidentiality of a sponsor and a sponsee, that's where you get out those deep, dark secrets that... Keep us sick. Great. Um, hey, my name is Bill, and um, I struggled with, with anonymity um, for a very long time before I came to, to Jesus. Um, and I know today I'm only as sick as my secrets, and I understand about confidentiality for everybody else, but for me personally, um, I got to the point where the more I laid down at the foot of the cross to Jesus, he told me what would be okay to share. Um, and that being said, and following the steps, like I don't want to do it by hurting somebody else in publicly, but um, for me, I'm at the point now where Linda worries because she never knows what I'm going to say. <laughs> um, I share it all. No, I I've, I've honestly have nothing to hide because I know I'm only as sick as my secrets. And I found out that the more I share, because I'm a testimony junkie, 12, 11 revelations is my favorite thing. Um, the less I have to hide, the more it could hurt me. I mean, I, I'm, I was so embarrassed with this stuff I did drink, and I don't see how I could possibly embarrass myself anymore up here. You know what I'm saying? So. <laughs> no. Okay. So f I think for me, um, for confidentiality, you know, this program doesn't work unless we work it and we work all the steps. Because trust me, I've tried to omit what I want to omit, omit, not admit, omit what things and it didn't work. So I have to trust that, you know, I know that it, it takes 100% commitment and confidentiality as part of the program. Mm -hmm. um, so I just have to trust that, you know, anybody who is here is working a program. And if they're not, then either one, they're not going to keep coming back or two, I look at it as I'm not a Bible scholar, but the Bible tells us to go directly to the person if we have an issue. And then if that doesn't work, you go to the others in, in the community. So I would imagine that's how I would handle it. 
Yes, thank you so much for that. Um, you know, it was um, spoken, I forget who exactly said it, but it was very similar. Um, the idea is that if somebody is breaking your anonymity or your confidentiality, which um, doesn't happen often, and I think that's the gist that we got here, is that we can trust the people inside here um, are going to uphold confidentiality and anonymity. However, if somebody does, I think approaching that person and letting them know about their behavior, because, you know, we come into these rooms with a lot of bad habits, right? We come into these rooms, and it's easy for us to be able to start engaging with those habits, even though we could be staying sober, and we may be at a different part of our um, recovery. So if somebody goes up to that person and just lets them know that this is actually what they're doing, I would imagine that they're going to stop. If it doesn't, then it would be seeking um, a team leader such as myself or any of these people, and we can approach them together and just talk to them and figure out what exactly is happening. But we always will keep anonymity and confidentiality to the utmost importance here. And so we have time for a couple more. Um, when does the pain stop? When does the pain stop? Christine. So the pain lessens, but for me, life happens and life brings hurt. So I can say without a shadow of a doubt, there will always be times in my life where there's pain, but I have tools to help me get out of that pain. And I think prior to recovery, my pain would last for weeks and months, long days, long nights. I'd go camping with it, you know. Now, I don't like to camp, so <laughs> I may go to a hotel for a night, but I ain't camping with it anymore. <laughs> so my pain um, has a program, right? And I have sponsor, I have accountability, and I have a higher power named Jesus that can help me through all of my pain. I just have to choose to use it. So the amount of time I stay in my pain normally is the amount of time my heels are dug in and I don't want to deal with it. Thank you for that. Yep. Um, can I speak into that? Yeah. I just saw... I just hadn't ever thought of that really for a while. And for me, the pain is the greatest when I'm alone. It's intensified. But because I've made connections in these rooms, it's lessened through other people. I don't necessarily even have to, you know, I've got connections that I just know that they're there for me and they're praying for me. And so it's kind of spread out and lessened. Nice. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we, the more we avoid working our program, the more the pain is going to, um, kind of like what another question asked, the more it's going to spin in our head. And um, I know my sponsor told me one time, you don't, believe in, you don't believe anybody as much as you believe yourself. So if you find yourself spinning inside of pain, you're telling yourself that you're in pain, then you're believing that you're in pain, and then that pain is becoming worse. And that's the point of a sponsor, that's the point of coming to groups, is to have the openness and the vulnerability recognizing that there's anonymity and confidentiality happening to where we can open ourselves up to somebody else so we don't have to stay with it and that um, other people have the opportunity to respond to that vulnerability with love. I ran, for re from re I ran from reality for a long time. And this is life on life's terms. And, uh, you know, things happen. People don't, you know, people misbehave even though I'm sober, right? But, you know, if I didn't have problems, if I didn't have pain, why would I need God? Yeah. There you go. Can I touch on that? Yep. And then we're going to do one last question, and it's going to be great. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> <laughs> My name like is Curtis, talk. and I you say really don't weird things sometimes. <laughs> so. um, I'm going to take it anyway. Okay. <laughs> uh, pain is, is, is something, um, you know, the Bible talks about long sufferings. That's a tough question for a lot of people. A lot of us have personal pain. All our pain is personal. Um, and it wasn't until I gave my life to Christ that I was able to see that. Because I used to go to speaker meetings, and honestly, I used to laugh and judge people and say, I'm not that bad. Um, but when I accepted Christ in my heart, I didn't just accept the crucified Christ, the risen Christ. I also accepted the Christ that was flogged and beaten beyond recognition. And I take my pain there because nobody is hurting as bad as I was. At least that's the way I felt. 
Um, so I needed to take it to the one person who really was beaten worse than me. And by doing that, um, it helps. But it, it could take a long time, honestly. But that's, that was a start for me. Some pains I've, I've brought up to communion like six, seven years in a row. Um, but that's a good place to do it too, is when you take communion, you don't always have to do it in celebration. You could humble yourself before God and lay your, your feet right down, uh, lay, lay it right down at the feet of the cross and do it that way. Thank I have you. a burning desire on pain. Um, all right. Pain is a good indicator that this is an area in my life that needs treatment. So especially if it keeps coming up and it's in the same spot, it's a good time to seek out treatment in that area. And by treatment, I mean working with others, going to more meetings, uh, praying about it. See a doctor. Call your sponsor. Yep. That's that's great. Thank you. And we're going to start at the far far end, and then we're going to come this way, and I just um, will end on this. And so does it really work? Does recovery really work? If it didn't work, I'd still be out there drinking. That's right. I didn't get sober to be miserable or to have my life improve. Um I had so many dreams on the couch, and uh, that's where they sat while I was drinking, until I got sober. So, <clears throat> I mean, <laughs> um, give it a try, and if uh, we'll gladly re, re uh, what is it? Refund your misery. That's the word. <laughs> we'll gladly refund your misery if it doesn't work for you. But um, there's millions of people that this is work for, and it can work for you too. Thank you. Diane? Yes, I would say clearly Larry and I met in recovery and managed to stay sober because we each work our own program. And um, we've managed to stay married for a long time. So it's, it's working. We're going to try it again tomorrow. She stayed sober married to me. <laughs> it's got to work. That's right. <laughs> Christine? So the only way I think recovery works is if I work it. It doesn't work me. I have to put in the hard work. And I sat in these seats out here many a times for many a months. I think it was nine months before I actually decided that maybe I would take a step and do some of the work. So those nine months were just time for me to fill a seat. But it took nine months of hearing things over and over and over again before I decided I was worth it. And so I decided to work it. Thank you. Linda? Baby, you're worth it. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> um, so if this disease has continued through our family. You know, we have kids. And, and one time out of frustration, which was a real eye-opener, I, I drew a family tree. And I drew my side, and I drew Bill's side, and there was jails, institution, and death all over these trees. There was two semi-normal people out of probably 50. Um, I could rewrite that tree today and it would be, there would be new blooms of recovery. Mm. Probably six, seven people in recovery instead of all that death and destruction. And, and it started with us. I mean, it's just, it spreads one way or another. It's awesome. Yeah, to elaborate on that, it's, it's quite funny to see that we were the ones that turned their lives around. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It was God. But it was still funny. <laughs> um, yeah, so <laughs> I was just away on a retreat with, with a lot of Christian people, and um, it dawned on me. The, the difference for me in Celebrate Recovery to even, not I want to knock AA, but AA and even other Christians in the church in general, 90% of the guys, when asked, what is your order of life, they would say God, family, and me, others and me. And it's like the difference for me is God than me. Because if I'm not true to myself, I can't be true to my family and others. Um, and, you know, the, the, the two biggest words in the Bible are love and truth. And most of those guys would say love, number one. I was like, no, it's truth. 
And Jesus even says, truth is the most important word because without truth, you can't know how to love. Um, I used to love so sick and demented, even through my codependency, codependency, even before I knew what it was. But the truth will always take you to where you need to be. Nice, thank you. Um, does it really work? Um, the answer is yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. Oh, we have, works. yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> the, the answer is yes, it, it really does. Um, you know, the idea that we dedicate our lives to um, improving ourselves so that we have the opportunity to be there for others is very real, and we do it through the power of God. Um, step 12 says, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we carry these messages to other alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. You know, the idea is that this is something that you can start, that God will continue to walk beside you, and all you have to do is make the next right decision. Um, I was just telling these guys in the meeting right before we came up on stage that um, almost eight years ago, I made the next right decision, and that was to stay sober. I had no idea where it would take me. All I wanted to do was have relief from the reason that I was miserable. And like Larry said, if you're not satisfied, we will return your misery for free. Um, and that's something that was very real for me. I just had to make the next right decision, and I get to experience freedom from my pain and from my addictions. I get to experience peace on a daily basis, something that I pursued from the moment I woke up to the time I got my next hit or my next drink. I get to experience family that had once discredited me and said, no more. I've been kicked out of their house. I've been suspended from family. Eight years, almost eight years ago, I made one decision to pursue recovery and to make the next right decision. And it works. And as Christine said, it works when you work it. So thank you guys so much for your questions. I think they were really great. If we could please give our panel a round of applause. You guys are all set. Thank you. And at this point, I'm going to invite our friend Sam up, and she's going to take us through the celebration. Yeah. Hi, guys. Um, I'm going to reintroduce myself because I realized that I was skipping the most important part. So as I said, I'm Sam, but as I did not say, I'm a codependent, and I work a program for um, anger, control, and love and relationships. Um, so thank you guys so much for coming up here. Hi. <laughs> thank you so much for coming up here. I love when we have these nights. I think they're really, really great for new newcomers to see, like, where you can be. I remember coming in one of the first times and hearing these things and thinking, oh, my gosh, I can't wait to have that much peace, that much confidence, that much all kinds of positive things. But it's also really good for a regular, for a refresher, to a, a reminder to know, oh, yep, thank you for that. <laughs> I needed to hear that tonight. Um, so thank you guys. There's a lot of wisdom on this stage. Um, okay, so we're going to move into a time of celebration. So at Celebrate Recovery, we love to celebrate milestones in our recovery. And the way that we do this is by using chips to represent time that we achieved in our area of struggle. Um, so if I could also get my chip huggers up, that would be cool. <laughs> Uh, so what you get a chip for is between you and God. So um, our first chip is a blue chip. Um, and if you are a woman, please go to my right, your left, and a man to my left, your right. Um, okay, so blue chip. There are several reasons for picking up a blue chip. If you identify a new area in your life that you would like to surrender to Christ or an area you would like to take on, such as daily Bible reading, prayer, devotion, etc., or maybe you have relapsed and are now ready to begin again. Remember that there is no shame in coming back. We are just so glad that you've made it. So anyone for a blue chip? Yeah! Woo, good job, guys. Next is our red 30-day chip. It is red reminding us of the blood of Jesus shed on the cross and the forgiveness of our sins. Anyone for a 30-day red chip? Woo! 
Next is our green 60-day chip. By this time in our recovery, we start to grow in our relationship with Christ. Anyone for a green 60-day chip? Okay, keep coming back. White 90-day chip reminds us of the purity we find in Christ. It's a reminder that we have no reason to feel shame or guilt. Anyone for a white 90-day chip? Keep coming back. Yellow six-month chip stands for the friendship and fellowship we find at Celebrate Recovery and this church family. Yellow six-month chip, anybody? Keep coming back. Black nine-month chip represents the fact that we no longer are living in sin and darkness. Anyone for a black nine-month chip? Yeah! Gold coin, our metal is precious and our recovery is precious. And each year we not only count our sobriety in whatever area we struggle with, but we reflect in our ever-deepening relationship with Christ. So anyone for a year or multiple years? Yeah! So if you've started to feel a stirring and want a blue chip, here's another chance. Anybody ready for a blue chip? Okay, awesome, guys. Um, all right, so we are going to move into a time of giving. If this is your first time here, please don't give. Um, and if it's not your first time, think about it. You can text, you can give it in person, um, or you can give through the app. Um, so we are about to move into our um, open share meetings and um, chemical dependency uh, meetings. So men will be on my left, your right, women on my right, your left. And now if we can please stand so we can close together in prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Okay, thanks, guys.